Okay, so we'll start getting into troubleshooting and corrective actions. Um, we'll take about 15, 20 minutes tops to get through. I'm gonna cover the pretreatment portion of that. So let me just, uh, I'm gonna have a stopwatch going here. So I don't keep you guys late on lunch. How about that? So, all right, so let's dig in. All right, so what are corrective actions, right? Identify parameters. Uh, they should have a, a normal operating range. Identify if they're in range or out of range. Uh, and then again, <clears throat> what potentially could happen as a result if they are out of range. There are chemical uh, as well as mechanical based corrective actions. Uh, and then again, there's gotta be some follow up. So if you run a test, something's out of range and you do nothing about it, you might as well not have run the test, right? So those, these corrective actions are important. This is where we're going to make sure that we actually keep our system um, running the way that it should, so. So as my boss likes to say, so you know what to sample, where to grab the sample, how to make sure it's a good sample, how to run a proper test, and where to log the reading, now what, right? So you did all that work, and then if you're not gonna do anything about it to correct a problem, or pick up the phone and make a phone call, why did you do all that work necessarily? So always before you do anything, if you get a bad reading or whatever, it's not a bad idea to resample or re-rinse your cup and then rerun or, or redo a test, right? Um, sometimes you can get contamination um, or just a bad color change or whatever may happen that um, might skew your, your testing results. Okay, so most common uh, problems associated with filters, right, is again, high pressure loss. You let the filter run too long. Um, improper application. Uh, so when I say that, again, maybe you selected a filter that's not rated for 180 degrees and you open up your filter housing and you're like, why is my filter disintegrating every time, right? Because it's not the right filter. Or I can't tell you how many times I've seen a new construction, um, uh, you know, a pipe fitter's putting in a filter housing they're just they're they're putting it in where they were told to put it in maybe they don't question it and you take your supply and your return off the same pipe so you have no pressure differential to actually push through that filter housing so then you go and you test a loop that you thought had chemical treatment in it and you get a erroneously high number coming to find out that um, it's not plumbed right so the chemical that was added was never actually added into the system so uh, and i know there's at least one person in the audience that we've gone through that with so um, and then again, plugging and fouling um, uh, are, are issues that may be happening. Is your, again, your filter not the right type of filter? Is it too fine a filtration for how dirty of a system that you have? Um, all those things. Most common problem with filters, again, so look at these bad boys. So <laughs> that's a customer of mine, and um, that was the worst chilled water loop that I have ever seen in my life. The loop literally looked like that. So. Um, it was really bad, but we got onto it, and he was on top of filter changes, flushing his system out. I am happy to say that loop now is clear water when you grab a sample. So um, it took a lot of time. Um, we're talking about a year uh, of doing this to get it back to where we wanted, but um, that's what happens if we do have poor water treatment and no filtration. Those were in for, I don't know how long they were in for, prior to me being there. Um, softeners, things that go wrong with water softeners, right? Most common things, no salt. Seems like a no brainer, but how many times you're the guy who had salt, you go on vacation, uh, I, I, I come in, the softener's hard, and I immediately open the brine tank, it's like, oh, well, John's not here, and that's John's job, right? He's the only guy who adds salt into our softener. So um, that's important to make sure that we don't run out of salt. How quickly does your softener go through salt? Those are the things that you should try to learn. Some systems, again, maybe you don't go through that much salt. Other systems, you're adding 20, 40 bags a day. And so pretty quickly you can empty out that brine tank if you're not staying on top of that. Programming bad, um, see that quite often. You know, uh, you get into a plant, um, maybe something was wrong and they thought, oh, well, I'll just change the settings on the softener and that should help out, right? Um, and then it's no longer programmed properly, so it's not going to work properly. Again, sizing it, super important. Um, too big or too small, you're gonna have issues. And then again, seals and internals go bad over time on softeners as well. So um, softeners work really well until they don't, and then they normally don't work well at all. So um, I always advocate for you should be on some type of PM program for your softeners that we're not waiting for them to fail 
and then it's rush city because, hey, I'm having 100 ppm of hardness go to my steam boiler and I'm scaling it up and it's freak out mode. If we are proactive about it, we hopefully eliminate that. So some of the things you can do to check again and just see, okay, what can I maybe correct um, or is wrong? Again, rerun your sample, make sure that again, you just didn't have some wacky reading or um, testing a unit right after it comes online, you might get a false high hardness. Um, typically when a softener first comes online, there's gonna be a little bit of hardness slippage coming through. Same with right at the very end of its run. If you test the softener and it has 100 gallons to go, you're probably gonna get a higher hardness than if you tested it with 1,000 gallons or 5,000 gallons to go. So you know, note where you're testing, where you are at in that cycle. Um, uh, is the unit you're testing online? You don't want to test the unit that's offline. You want to make sure you test the unit that's online, right? So most of you are going to have either a twin alternating system, two tanks, right? This tank is on and it's running until it needs to be regenerated and then this one comes on. You might have a triplex system, so you have three tanks. Um, you can look and tell which softener is on. That's the one that you should be running your test on. Check your brine tank. Uh, again, do you have salt? Did the salt bridge? So I always like to recommend to people, you should have some type of rod or something that, again, weekly, you're sticking into your brine tank and you're making sure that you didn't have any bridging occurring, that salt can um, bridge, and then you don't actually have any salt in the water below it, but you think the tank is full of salt because it looks like it's full of salt. And then one thing you can always do is you can put a softener in a manual region, maybe a fluke, it just had a bad region, uh, and put the other softener online and then validate that that one's working properly. Uh, how do you know the softener is working? Uh, continued, right? So run a hardness test, right? So this is one of the tests that we're gonna have you run in your facility. If you have softeners, you should be testing and making sure that your softeners are working. Um, whether it's just feeding directly in your cooling tower or into your boiler, or if it's feeding into an RO, you should probably be checking the softeners feeding into the RO because you don't wanna, again, shorten the lifespan of those RO um, membranes. And boilers, we want we wanna aim for less than half a part per million of total hardness. Um, typically, especially again, depending on pressure, if you're running a five pound boiler versus a 500 pound boiler, it's gonna make a big difference. Um, and then soft water uh, for cooling towers, normally we're okay with up to 20 ppm because if you're cycling your cooling tower up about five times, right, that's about 100 ppm of hardness then in the cooling tower. Um, and that's more than fine for um, running a chemistry program in cooling towers. Hardness actually acts as a little bit as a corrosion buffer. so. Um, we want some in a cooling tower to prevent corrosion or help prevent corrosion. All right, so, you know, hey, my softener, I'm getting a short run, right? So it can, it can soften 10,000 gallons and I'm only getting 5,000 gallons out of it and then now it's going hard at 5,000 gallons to go down to zero, right? So something's checked. Did the raw water hardness change? So like I had said before, right? Does does maybe the water your supply you're getting change wells and it changes the incoming quality of that water. Maybe that's part of it. And so sometimes it's softening, you know, water that has 100 ppm incoming and then other times it's 200 ppm. Well, that's going to screw up your softener because it's programmed to probably soften for that 100 ppm. Did it have a poor regeneration? Resin fouling. Do you have loss of resin? Resin is going to break down over time. So at some point you're going to need to replace your resin in a softener system. Um, and so maybe it's just a factor of age. Maybe your drain line flow controller isn't working and you actually blew resin down the drain out of your softener. That can happen. Um, if you're having high hardness, again, is we're all water bypassing the unit. So, hey, I have high hardness in my cooling tower. Oh, I found that there's a bypass valve that got open somehow. And so we were adding, you know, straight city water in and it was skipping the softener. Again, maybe more resin fouling or increased hardness in the uh, raw water supply. And then pressure drop is typically due to bed fouling or the drain is plugged, um, et cetera. So again, typically when you have softener issues, reach out to your water treatment partner and they can help walk you through, okay, we'll check this, this, and this, and then we can maybe figure out from there. Again, run that brine elution study. That's really important uh, to do. Uh, again, annually is a good idea because it's just gonna prove the softener is working the way that it should. And so we won't get into too detailed on it, but a brine elution study is, uh, this is what it's gonna look like, right? Is it's not an uh, exciting thing to do. You sit at, by the drain, you grab a sample every two minutes, you test it for connectivity and for the amount of salt that's in it. And you should see a nice bell curve if things are working the way that it, 
wood, right? So A represents regeneration with saturated brine. You want a good saturated brine solution and B represents it if you had a dilute brine. So if you don't have enough salt in your brine tank to make a good concentrated brine, you're not going to get as effective of a regeneration. And then again, uh, you have what would look like a good one. So you start out and it slowly starts to ramp up and then it really takes off again around minute 20. And then we want to maintain, ideally you want to maintain 30% saturation for 30 minutes. So again, at 20 minutes to 50, we're maintaining that 30% saturation. That is ideal to get a good regeneration of that resin. And then here we would start our uh, rinsing cycle. And then again, it should take about 10 minutes to rinse all that salt back off pretty much down to zero. Then we've rinsed any excess salt that wasn't used in the process um, down. Um, this one you can see is again, we had insufficient brine. Um, so we need, to, we need to increase the amount of time that we're drawing brine out of that brine tank, right? And there's all these different scenarios. We won't go through them all, but just know if you run a brine elution study and you, get an, and you, you uh, graph it, you should be able to tell what's going on um, based upon um, this brine elution study. For ROs, again, what are the common problems? Hardness, again, coming from, the water softener is not working ahead of your RO, so it's giving you problems with your RO. It's not an RO problem, it's the water softener leading up to it, right? Did the, if you're feeding an anti-scale into your RO instead of softening the water, did the pump lose prime? Did you run out of chemical? Um, you know, something like that. Are the filters leading up to it plugging? Or the seal's bad? Or is the pump that's you know, supposed to be boosting that pressure not working? Um, or chlorine breakthrough, that's a big one. Uh, if you're getting city water, a lot of times they add chlorine into it. If the carbon filters that you have ahead of your RO aren't working and you're getting chlorine coming through, it's going to chew up those membranes. Um, so running a chlorine test on your RO system after, before the RO, but after your carbon filter, there should be a spot you can grab a sample. Um, it's good to make sure that you don't have chlorine that's getting through that carbon. Because at some point the carbon is going to go bad and it has to be replaced too. Uh, and that's a lot cheaper than replacing membranes. Or does your RO need to be cleaned? Typically, smaller ROs, maybe you're not really doing a lot of cleaning, but larger ROs like this, um, they're going to have um, CIP capabilities built right into it where you can hook up chemistries to do a CIP cleaning, um, and maybe it needs to be cleaned. So if hardness or conductivity are high, obviously check the incoming water, check your gauges. And then again, I had said earlier, each RO membrane, you have the ability to test. So it's hard to see here, but there are these little red sample valves and so it's a good idea to check every single membrane uh, and make sure that again it, all of them are having a problem one of them is having a problem none of our, none are having a problem it's not a bad idea to do that once in a while or at least when it seems like it's having a problem and then again monitoring and maintenance so you can determine if gradual fouling scaling or membrane degradation is occurring by observing performance so just so you see here this graph. So RO permeate flow in GPM is the blue line. You can see it's going down. RO pressure drop is the red. You can see it's going up. So what this is again showing is, hey, our pressure was going up and we're losing performance through RO. Time to clean this one. Um, this happens to be a large one that we do CIP in, in place. I hate these, sorry. So hard to talk. All right. All right, so far, we, we should hand out five-hour energy drinks, I think, after lunch. I think everybody should get a little shot of five hours so you're good to go for the rest of the afternoon. You get a little water tech ones, a little water tech emblems on it. Jeff, there's an idea. Friday, Friday. After lunch, we should get little little five-hour energy drinks with water tech emblems on them and hand them out and let everybody have one. Questions would never stop. Yeah, my ears would be bleeding. So, um, are we ready? Okay. So, uh, any questions so far on this morning? Again, remember, I can be persuaded and bought off and paid off. I'm a little more liberal about the gifts and the presents. Um, but there's a lot more. There's a lot more things to cover. This afternoon is going to be. Uh, we're going to start on some more of these corrective actions on a few things. Um, and we're going to do some other boiler stuff. And I got one more speech after this. So I'm going to cover a few things regarding some boiler water um, and steam, some testing, and some corrective actions that we've had. Um, so the only thing I'm going to preface this with is we're going to show you some pictures of um, some data, some actual data from customers. Now, you, don't, you may not know everything there is to know about the ins, ins and outs of it, okay? But what I want to do is I want to walk you through the troubleshooting process with, that we're looking at this. So maybe as a manager, if you're looking at these reports and you say, what's going on, what's going on, all right? 
start just something stuff, stuff to start thinking about. I'm also going to tell you that also I might throw a, a little curveball at you and I might tell you, well, these are lead leg boilers. All right. You're not going to get all this from the data we're going to show you. Okay. What we want to do is show you the data and start talking out loud about like, what are we looking at here? What, 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 what are we thinking? Just kind of help maybe run through like that ladder logic or the, the idea of what, you know, someone gave you a report or there's some, or you did your test yourself. And maybe there's something to think about, or maybe we can give you a different idea of looking at something. Okay. So obviously when we show you the stuff, we're not going to necessarily show you everything that there is about the system and a big layout and something like that. So just, we'll talk, openly discuss it. Okay. And again, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. So the thing with the boiler thing with, with boiler chemistry and the, and the boiler test that you're going to do, someone in the world had established some type of control range for you. Okay. Now it could be operating history or it could be ASME, mechanical engineers. Um, what they recommend for boilers based on uh, pressure ranges that your boiler operates at. Some of it could be boilerplate. <clears throat> you know what? We have the same boilers in, if you're local, you know, New Berlin, New Berlin Wisconsin, same ones in Waukesha, it's the same water source. We're just going to operate the same way because it works at that plant. We have just about the same thing, cookie cutter, boilerplate, same facility. Um, but typically what you do see is if you actually run the numbers on what the, what the limiting history or what the limiting factors are in most boiler systems, it's going to be iron and silica. Uh, and probably more times it'll be silica because silica is something we normally don't take out of pretreatment systems um, with, the, with, the, with the water. And then I, I guess I just kind of hinted at it, it's experience. Yes, you might be able to run 3,000 connectivity, um, but you know what, you, if you want to run that, you have a lot of boiler water carryover or the, the feed water can't keep up or the softeners can't keep up. So we got to run 4,000 or we have carryover. We need to run less. We probably should run 2,000. So uh, the experience is probably nine times out of 10 what might, over, what might be your trump card in terms of changing something the way it looks like. So, um, <clears throat> or the, so ASME, I talked about that, or the other one is ABMA, which is the American Boiler Manufacturers Association. Their guidelines, and again, they're going to go by operating temperature. They're going to provide you what, what it looks like throughout the process from your feed water tank down to your boiler water um, and, and where you are. And a lot of it's going to be based on your, on your pressure because uh, higher pressure boilers are going to require a much, much more refined, a much more pure makeup feed water. So as, you, as, that, boil, as that boiler pressure increases, the demand on your pretreatment system, pre system becomes more critical. And you notice what I said? It's the pretreatment system. All right, chemistry does play into it, but the, you, you can only get so, so much pure water, so you gotta start improving or making the changes to your pretreatment system. Again, going back to what I said before in my earlier one this, this morning, pretreatment system is gonna be a key to any bo successful boiler program. Chemicals are gonna help, and we're gonna help you with that, okay? But that pretreatment system, okay? So you might see some types of guidelines, or you might have a, <clears throat> some matrix like this filled out about what, you, what, what you're testing. Um, this is exciting, <laughs> okay? It's a lot of work, right? But I think what's even more exciting is this afternoon when they talk about innovations. And could you imagine doing all this? And then this afternoon they're gonna talk about innovations and about three quarters of this goes away. That's the exciting part about this afternoon with the innovations at the end of the presentation. So, but, or at the end of today, but. Um, so a lot of us have matrix that probably look like this. Check for sulfites in your boiler water, Check for polymer in your boiler water, check for the total iron in your condensate system, iron in your feed water, hardness. And you notice the hardness is all up here in the raw water and soft water in the, in the pre-treatment. So we, you have a matrix that's typically done between yourself and the, uh, um, your boiler water, your, your chemical treatment. So hopefully you have some type of control chart that you can compare everything to because it's great to run the tests and do the tests. If you know, but it doesn't mean anything unless you know what, what you're comparing it to. All right. So um, we typically provide a control chart that looks like this. We'll, we'll give you some real basic um, corrective actions, and you'll see that some of these are, are very typical. In, I mean, if connectivity is not in range, then you may, you may hold off on doing anything. Or if connectivity is in range, you need to increase the chemical feed pump. All right. <clears throat> Uh, boiler log sheets. Hopefully you guys have one of these things ready to rock and roll so that you can have it. This comes off our WTE service, which is an online program we use for data entry. Um, a lot of customers will print it off and then they'll use this as their log sheet for daily log entry and, um, 
in their in their boiler room, and then they transfer it to the online program. The, then we'll email email the report out. Um, so do you rate a corrective actions? Let's talk a little bit about something like this. Um, these are probably the most common problems that you'll see in it. You know, again, draw from my wonderful presentation this morning where we had that wonderful curve with temperature and pressure. Temperature and pressures aren't correlating because you, you know, there's something could be venting more out of a, with cover, something could be venting out of a, a deaerator more and it's not holding pressure. It's not building pressure. It's not getting temperature. Well, typically when it does all that, it's coming from the steam system itself. If it's not holding temperature and pressure or it's coming up. Um, or chemistries are out of range on the, on the, on the, um, the feed water, the deaerator, because you are testing it. You know, there, you, we are testing the storage section that's, uh, oops, that's in here. Oh, I know this customer. Um, so th there's a storage section on here, and I th this customer, we, I think we, we sample right there. So chemistry's not in range because you're testing this. So if chemistry's not in range here, they're not going to be in range downstream. And what's downstream of this? These boilers that are in the background here. There's one in here and there's one right there. And then the other one is con contamination. Because remember we said we have condensate coming back from this thing? Well, where's the con condensate being used? If it's a production facility, it's out, it's out on production floor. Or it's some aspect of production, some heat exchanger. Or, it's, um, or it even can come from contamination on a, on a, on a heating system that's just using for HVAC because there, like, there could be a heat exchanger that's failed. So that's all coming back to these, this deaerator. So you can see contamination. So if the temperature and pressure, <clears throat> um, you really got to come that back to what is it you're reading. Because if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So if your pressure gauges and your temperature gauges aren't running right, um, you're, you're going to have unreliable. It's like a speedometer in a car. <laughs> it ain't running right, you're probably going to get busted for speeding. Right? So you need to check the accuracy of the gauges and, and just do uh, you know, simple checks on the control system and, and stuff of that, of that sort, just so you know that you got the right information and the right data that you're dealing with, all right? But also there's a couple of things you could check, you know, it may not be the gauges or the pressure, or the, the pressure gauges and the temperature gauges may be accurate, but it could be something else that contributes to it. Because remember the deaerator, we got to have steam to raise the temperature and generate the pressure. Well, there's two things. Well, the steam isn't getting to it, it's not getting to it right, not getting enough to it, then the other one is, um, we'll cover this, is this vent. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but this, this, the, remember we showed you that there was vents coming out of the deaerator? There's a, there's a really quick way you can look at that to see if you're, if you're venting properly also. So deaerator performance is a monitor, is you know, you, gotta, you can also get a dissolved oxygen analyzer um, because again, we're monitoring it. You can measure it. You can get uh, these chemetric test, tests, um, um, AccuVacs are already, they got a vacuum to it, you pop it off and it sucks in the water and then you just do a color metric comparison to see what your oxygen levels are. Um, hold it up to the light, like what this operator is doing, to see what, what it looks like and you can see if you, what the oxygen levels are that are coming out or going to your, to, your D, um, to your boiler system. Hopefully it's nothing, but if it's not working right, you could shut your chemistry off and then check your dissolved oxygen levels for a few days or you know, let it run for a few shifts to get the, the sulfites out. But you can test it to see how well your system is running. Um, or you can, get, you, can get, you can get online analyzers too, and those are pretty expensive too. But um, I think I have one customer that, that uses um, an online analyzer. And they do, then we double check it with um, uh, the AccuVax, the, chem, the Chemnetrix um, visual ones. Uh, you should check temperature, pressure, sufficient steam flow, and then this is the other one. So this is your vent. Here's your vent one. If you don't, you're not seeing at least a 12 to 18 inch flume coming off the the the, the pressure side, the vent of the deaerator. You probably are going to have issues because what happened is something's restricting either the flume or the plume that's coming off of the uh, deaerator. So if that's the case, then you're you're not allowing the gases to get out of your deaerator. So they're they're stuck in the they're stuck in the uh, deaerator. Or you're not generating enough pressure and temperature to get to allow the, the gases to get out. So then now you now you got now the temperature of the water is not hot enough to drive off the oxygen. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? And we'll, I will show you some pictures of that. Or what it could be is you could have a, a poor spray pattern. So remember on that one picture it showed you where that one column was where 
Um, we call it the tray or the spray pad in the location. So depending on what it is, you could have nozzles that are clogged in there that aren't allowing the spray to create the surface area to drive off the air or the oxygen. Or your trays could be clogged because there'll be holes in the trays to allow the water to fall through a tray to fall through another tray because you're again, you're trying to increase the surface area to allow the oxygen and the air to escape out of the water, right, the gases. So you could also have spray patterns. Obviously these are things you gotta check, you know, when it's down, it's, you gotta have a chance to inspect it. Nozzles get clogged because you remember we got iron coming back that, you know, or dirt or debris could come back. It come from, could come from the pretreatment system too. <clears throat> so here we have, an, we have a plume coming out. Now I would say pay attention to this closer plume, not the fact that it comes out here, but here we could have a potential situation where maybe you don't have enough pressure coming out of that plume. Even though it is horizontal, typically you see them vertical, but you know, you really don't have a driving force where you would say that the diameter of this pipe is about the same diameter as that 18 inches or so out from, from, the, from here. Um, the other reason is to have it is that that way you know if you have enough steam coming out of there, you're not corroding that pipe also because you have exit velocities that are not allowing condensate or anything to happen. So hopefully it's, it's uh, not allowing moisture to condensate or steam to condense, condense inside that tube. Here it's vertical, but you can kind of see this, this plume, right? Comes up, but it doesn't do anything. And if you look at it, it's actually losing water on this roof. Yes, it's the middle of winter, but it's just not driving it out. So you're not, you're not getting that pressure and that release of the gases out of the plume. You'll see, these are typically the, the, the the orientations you see them in vertical and horizontal. Normally they're vertical. Uh, boiler co corrective actions, the most common problems you'll see is a boiler that's out of range. And we could probably make a make 10 pages of reasons connectivity is out of range, but um, there's so many reasons that it, it, it is. And uh, it can be, it, which then can cause the chem chemistry is being out of range. Um, other problems that people might see is cloudy colored water. It's just discolored for some reason. Um, if it's milky looking, it's probably iron, or not iron, um, calcium or magnesium or some type of hardness. If it's red, it's probably iron. Um, I actually had one boiler that was green and it was copper. Um, but uh, uh, there could be many reasons that the discoloration, but typically it almost looks like drinking water. Don't drink it, but it does look, typically a good well running system looks like drinking water. And then the other one is boiler water carryover, where literally the, the water, the steam that the water that's in the boiler makes its way into the steam header itself and it, it just carries itself over to the steam system. So this is where we're going to show you some tests, some tests that were actually done um, on, on at a customer's location. Um, we're going to blame Jeff for all this because um, it was his it was his uh, it was his customer. So you run you run a test boiler one. So I don't know if how many are familiar with this. So here's the nice thing about this program. Just a little. Um, so if you're a Packer fan, this is awesome. Green and gold, the rocks, all right? You guys don't have a team in Nevada, do you? We do now. Vegas. Oh, yeah, Vegas. Oh, yeah, that's right. The old Raiders, that's right. Yeah, so we don't have, we don't have black and silver on here. But we can, I don't have black and silver on here. So anyway, so then the, the other bust in the chops would be as uh, bear, bear, bear fans, uh, red, Orange, slaughtered. yeah, they're always getting slaughtered. <laughs> and then, the, or if you're a 49ers fan, you know that the other, that's the other color, red and red and orange. Um, green and gold is good. That's all that really matters in this part of the world, anyways, right? Packer fans is what is, is the biggest concern. So, green and good is typically gold in our program here. And then the other colors that aren't green and gold, same as the rest of the NFL team, doesn't really matter. Okay, but um, so typically as a manager, you look at it and say, well, I got red, I got I got orange. Something's something's a muck. Doesn't make sense. Okay. We got low connectivity in boiler one. We got, looks like pretty good, pretty good in range, just out of range, boiler, in boiler number three and everything else looks good. The deaerator, your pretreatment system looks pretty good, right? And your condensate returns coming back, a little orange right here with 9.14, just out of range with 8.8, .8, okay? But um, we're gonna look at this right here too, all right? Polymers in range down here too, all right? Now what I'm not gonna, what I'm gonna tell you about this, this is also a lead leg system, okay? Meaning one boiler, um, is the main, and then the other one is a trim boiler, or you might know as a trim boiler, but it comes on secondary. When the first boiler can't keep up, and it's for whatever the set points are, the, the other boiler will kick in, okay? Uh, just, 
DDS, they are doing that too. So that could also play into it. All right. Um, so here's what I would start doing. So this is what they re this is what they first came up with. But I would I do this one over right here. Start over. Run your tests again. Maybe you didn't do something right. Maybe something was slightly contaminated. Maybe the guy in the previous shift did screwed something up. Just rerun the test, all right, before you start getting excited about it, okay? So run it, redo it, do your stuff over again, okay? Just to make sure. Better safe than sorry. So what we might want to do is we might want to check for improper losses, right? Because this is kind of low. It doesn't seem to be cycling up. Remember we talked about cycling? It's not supposed to cycle up like it should have. That's one thing you'd probably want to do. And then the other thing I would ask, is this a normal kind of, that we, is this normal operations? I think we are going to agree that it's not normal operations. Whoops, sorry. And then I touched about the pH. So, so could this be related to poor boiler readings? Ah, uh, it could, right? That's why we asked you to, to resample it. Um, but like I said before, actually, it's not, it's kind of almost normal because of the lead leg operations we're talking about. Now, I'm not saying it's completely acceptable, but because, again, like I described, one boiler is running most of the time. Oops, that's boiler number three, right? And boiler number uh, one is um, uh, the leg boiler. So it doesn't get the run time like it should. But the controller doesn't know any better, so the controller is still going to blow it down to make sure things are going right. So it might have been losing some water, and it's just not running as it normally, do, as it normally should. So this, this could be considered possibly a little bit normal operations. However, if it was our side, what I'd say is that we should be switching prior. If you're worried about it, either A, run higher chemistries in boiler one, or B, switch the boilers from lead leg so that one gets some runtime and gets more chemistry in it. Because in a lead leg situation, that leg boiler typically isn't getting the chemistry on a regular basis like the lead boiler is. And then the other one would be, um, the other one would be this, since this seems to be in range, and this seems to be in range, and this is just really from a lead leg situation, this is probably just a slight chemical overfeed. So turn the pump down a little bit. All right? Does it kind of make sense? You see when we were talking? Because the, or the other argument would be, what if this wasn't a lead leg? Well, what could happen is this boiler is losing water, so it's not cycling up. But at the same time, the boiler that is running all the time seems to be fine. Right? Well, then you probably have some type of water loss in here that just isn't allowing the boiler to get the chemistry in it. That's why. Because you can see when the boiler is running normally as it should, the numbers are all in range. So it gives you an idea that you're probably feeding your chemistry at the right rate. Because you got one boiler that's doing pretty good. The other one just isn't getting used or it's blowing down too much. But this is actually lead leg, so this is probably more normal than anything else. All right? So here's a, another, another test um, where um, boiler two, well, well, uh, when you compare the two boilers, connectivities aren't exactly close, but they're, they're you know, close enough. But if you look at the two, the two sulfites, they're both really high, even with one just being slightly out of range, but this one's even more out of range, but sulfites are still a little high when you compare them with the, with the two boilers and the connectivities, right? So, you, if, but the low connectivity, we probably want to be looking for water losses again, because because remember we said we, the, we let let it get up so high, then you got to blow it down. That, that's the only way the water's getting out of it. Okay, yes, there's carryover, but that's a different situation. So, um, but it's, so it's going down the drain. So it's going down the drain. Well, why is it going down? Maybe you're improperly blowing down the boiler system. Maybe a timer's messed up or valve stuck open, or someone's got a bypass open on the on the boiler they're not supposed to. You know what I mean? Um, or an operator said, well, I'm just going to blow on a boiler because it was really bad, and so I just blew it down and left it open, right? And then again, you might want to check also that lead leg operation. Maybe the set points are quite, aren't, quite, aren't quite right. We had it at one point where we, uh, we had a float, and the, the magnetic switch on the float itself... On the, on the shutoff? Yeah. Okay. Built up sediment. Yep. Yep. We had a melted, I didn't do it. We got an account one because they had the electronics, the electronic ones too, and they melted their boiler. And we was a new customer. We got the customer then after that, but um, it was, but it was because of buildup in their in their shutoff. Yeah, it can be really critical. <laughs> yep. Um, since con since connectivity is low, right here, 
This is, these both are probably because of overfeeding of the chemical. The reason, I mean, so remember we talked about, some of you might say, well, how can you be overfeeding the chemical if the connectivity is low? Well, remember we're cycling up a boiler. So the chemistry stays behind and just the steam goes out. Well, then we've got to add more water, more chemistry back into the boiler. So as we're doing that, what happens is you're adding chemistry, but steam's going out. Well, the connectivity is still low. This, this ratio, the best way, the easiest way to describe it is pretty much a direct correlation. If you double the connectivity, in theory, all these numbers probably should just about double also. So if you, if you double this and put this in range at 2,800, this in theory would be around 100, 100, 140, 130. Because again, you're doubling everything. Because you're still adding the same amount of chemistry for the same pound, of, same pound of water you're putting in for that one pound of water that's going out. So you're still overfeeding that chemistry. So this is likely because of an overfeed of the chemistry. Even with this one, it's just slightly out of range, it's still enormously high. But now you have a way to control that. You can just shut down the, the oxygen scavenger chemical pump. You can turn, not shut it down, but turn it down a little bit until it comes down. Um, or the other thing, it could be water losses too. So we'll show you this part too in the next one. Again, this is that part where I told you to think about something. And I was saying it could be because of this and this, but you don't know everything surrounding the, the customer. So what happens is it could also be because um, when you look at that, this low connectivity in the operations of what the probe is doing. So what happened was, is this the graph? This is the graph I want to show you. So water losses is because of blowdown, right? So what could have been happening also with the same customer is you see the connectivity is coming across and all of a sudden this drops off. The boiler temperature probe section of the probe, after you do some further investigation, could have also been the failure. Connectivity in a boiler is dependent on the temperature of the, of the, of the probe, all right? So again, even us talking about this, as you're walking through the troubleshooting and corrective action of this, you also got to consider why is what's going on or, or what's causing possibly some of these errors. Th the tests are probably right, but what could be happening is it could, the, the controller itself could be getting bad data in it. So what it's doing is it's blowing down the boiler more because it thinks it's, it's something's wrong. And then in this case, you can see that the connectivity started to come up and the, and the, and the, and the temperature came out and dropped out because the, the, the connectivity relies on temperature to provide an accurate reading. The other thing that can happen is when you're having that low, that low reading because the connectivity is down, the connectivity is dropping, falling out, and you, you're thinking, well, it should be blown down like it should. Everything else seems to be right. Well, if you look at this, this is the blowdown valve. If you check the blowdown piping to make sure it's everything's reading accurately, because what will happen is, is if the probe's reading junk, the controller is going to operate based on the junk that's going on. Well, if you look at this one, this valve isn't closed all the way, because this little box right here indicates the direction of the valve. This is a ball valve, even though. So this is telling me that this is the direction of the opening, or no. Yeah, this is the direction of the opening. It's slightly open, but the controller thinks it's off. So it's continuously blowing down, and it's not supposed to. It's intermittent blowdown. So you're checking, checking the valve stem here, and it looks like a little crooked. It looks like something broke here, too. So, But because of this, you, other, other many, many boilers, they also have bypasses around it, so you might want to check the bypass or check the, for internal leaks or something of that sort. Maybe, you know, there's another valve that's leaking by. So this is that, that same system. Again, you don't, you, you, I, you obviously, if you guys would have seen all this, you, you probably might have seen more, maybe more other obvious reasons. But again, this is where you get the data, you see what it is, but the investigation and the corrective action really depends on what else is going on in the system that the data may not show. So here, here the probe comes down, it, it's submerged. So I mean, I would think that the, you know, the probe should be, should be doing fine. However, when it drops off, if this is leaking by, this could just be steam pushing through here too. So if the steam is just pushing through there, it's not gonna read accurately either because it wants to measure boiler water, not boiler steam. So it may not, so you may not be measuring the right, the, the right, the right type of water. Because again, they measure connectivity of the, the boiler water, not the connectivity of the, of the steam. And that's gonna cause 
the Pro to read inaccurately too. Um, this is this is showing you um, just an, an install. This on this side, and these are just other places where you could have you know the, the bypass leaking by or these valves failing. These things that you know these these are bottom blows. These these valves may not be in the right position. They could be blown down the bottom of the boiler. Um, uh, unexpectedly. So you're just letting water go down the drain that you're not expecting it. Um, another boiler problem. So if you look at the number of the sulfites, so the, the softener looks good, right? Feed water looks really good. Rocking and rolling. Condensate looks really good. pH a little high. Um, and then uh, uh, the boiler. Looks like the connectivity of the boiler is reading a little bit high and it looks like we don't have any sulfite. PM alkalinity is fine. This is the phosphates, the internal boiler water treatment. Looks like that's a little bit low. Um, those are like probably the biggest concerns you have here, right? We already said that. <clears throat> so where are we adding the sulfite? We had the sulfite to the deaerator, right? And a number one, if you have zero and your and your connectivity is high, you should be having some type of sulfite in the boiler. A zero is a good indication you don't have anything in, in, in going in there. All right. Now, obviously with this one, we know what's going to the feed water tank, but the basic idea is that we don't have chemicals going in there. So that's what this would tell me to look into is, is the sulfite chemical test. I mean, I guess, yes, in theory, it could, if you start running through it, it could be the controller or maybe a relay valve failed or depending on how they're physically adding the chemistry to it. But at, at least as a minimum, you know that the, the boiler itself is not getting any, any chemistry or any chemistry going in. And then the other one is the high conductivity. Now this could be, the other thing I would say about this is this could be intermittent too. So if you typically a boiler, when you have it on a controller, does intermittent blowdown. So, I mean, it'll sample like every two hours or three hours or some, maybe even once or twice a day, depending on the size of the system. You know, so th this, th when we, when th this was done, it's put possible that the, the operator could have recorded a temperature in between those blowdown times too. You know, does that make sense? If I say I'm going to blow down every 12 hours, I, I measure now at noon or 1 o'clock, I'm sorry, and then it doesn't blow down until 1 o'clock in the morning. If I measure at 10 o'clock at night, that's, that's been 10, 11 hours or 9, 11 hours of, of the connectivity to the boiler just building and building and building, but yet the controller doesn't know. You know what I mean? Is that the controller doesn't know, and your data wouldn't know either. So, and the condensate pH is probably related to what we've been talking about when it comes to the condensate pH. Probably an overfeed. We talked about that. Talked about that. But does it? This is great, right? So I just said condensate, probably chemical feed. Look into it, right? This is this is this is that customer. This is that customer. That's sulfite. <laughs> so there's probably a reason why the sulfite's not getting into the tank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then, so this I think I, I don't remember if this is a feed water tank or if this is a, a oops a deaerator. But the other thing is that's your chemistry, right? And what's the other thing I told you this morning about when how where should the sulfite be injected? Into the water. So it, the, I, I believe if I remember correctly, this isn't my customer, but I remember correctly. I thought someone told me that th this just goes right in here and it runs right through that air column. So, not to, you know, there could be a tube in there. Maybe they, they did this, they took the extra effort and they ran a tube all the way down into the water, down into the water, that's fine. But something's leaking, yeah. The leak is probably my first suspicion, since it, it, it looks like a, a discombobulated haircut. And then, they could, or there could, maybe this is, this is just recent, but there, if there was a tube in here, maybe that tube also failed inside there too. But it's not getting sulfite. So again, I think this is the thing, never hesitate to question everything. This is a good question. So, um, everybody know what a, an injection quill is? No? All right. So the question is, should it go through a quill? I would say probably, especially on a boiler system, because a quill will inject it further into the water, you know, either whether it be two inches, six inches, or whatever the size of that injection is. Essentially, uh, I'm sorry, let me describe an injection quill. I don't think we have one here. It's like a big needle, all right? A big needle that goes into a pipe. 
um, or it goes into a tank. And so what it does is instead of it coming right to the instead of, instead of a, a coming right to the, the surface of whatever it's in, wherever we're injecting the chemistry, the idea is that it, it just puts it in further so that it doesn't react with anything immediately. It helps prevent some immediate reactions that might happen if you just like put it here and then let it react. So it puts it in further into the water so it helps with reactions and mixing and stuff. So I would say, yeah, it probably should. And those, this injection coil can have different types of lengths for that. So um, uh, um, it's a great question, though, but yeah, probably should. So. <clears throat> um, steam, condensate corrective actions. So most common problems we have with um, uh, steam condensate corrective or steam uh, condensate systems, um, high conductivity because it's kind of an indication of possibly poor, you know, poor condensate. Remember that description we had before about improving the quality of the condensate and maybe collecting more. Uh, high pH or even low pH. Um, total hardness. Um, we had talked about that earlier with you and you know, monitoring it potentially. Iron detection limits because uh, we, again with the steam line treatment and iron. If you're not maintaining your, the proper pH of the condensate, it'll attack that, that iron because the water doesn't have it. Just the chemical doesn't have iron in it. The, the condensate return system's got the iron in it. And then also the other concern is cold condensate because we talked about the venting of, of systems. And when the condensate condenses, it gets cold and then it sucks in the water. Um, another reason for slightly, you know, other reasons for it is um, when we talked about this a little earlier was that you could have a heat exchanger where you're using steam on one side, heating a process or heating it, and then what happens is your seals start failing on your, on your, um, your uh, heat exchanger. So if these fail, depending on, you know, either A, it could be process contamination or B, if it's water to water or steam to water, um, eventually something's going to give and it will likely contaminate the condensate system. So by monitoring the condensate system, they can tell you that if something else is contributing to the poor, to the poor condensate quality. So here's a, here's a graph over time um, that shows the total hardness over time over on this, on this axis and time on this axis of a, um, of a deaerator. So this is almost plays right into what we're talking about with you. Um, I don't mean to pick on you, it, just, it's a great, it was a great question and a great example. And here's a conductivity that over time of, of, of the deaerator. So what we have here is um, the hardness is going up over time, getting up to four, and then it drops off. And then here over time it starts off at 120 and over time it comes right down and then comes back up. Oh. Sorry, so it's pointing at a couple of the inflection points. Here's what we found out it was. It was a, it was a heater, a domestic a heat exchanger, a heater out in the system that had copper on or I think, I don't know if it was copper, I don't remember if it was copper or, or steel. But chlorine got aggressive on the water side of it, but it eventually led to the failure of it. So the hardness was leaking through, through, the, through the bundle onto the condensate. And also either one thing's going to push it out, it's either going to be the water pressure that's going to push it out or as that condensate or that steam is condensing, it's going to draw a vacuum on those tubes and suck some of that water in. So, and then again, it wasn't the, chem the chemicals failure, it was the chlorine side or the water side that caused the failure because that got corrosive. 110. Cheyenne, any questions guys? I noticed that when uh, our process one or process two hot water heat exchangers get a hold of it, mm -hmm. the conductivity of my boiler shoots up. Yep. So then it leads me right to those, and then I take the conductivity reading straight from the and I can tell which one is actually leaking by. Yeah, I, we have a customer that makes some makes some stuff, and he can tell when an operator doesn't follow the right procedure because what happens is he get the the plant isn't softened. The only softeners are in the boiler, and he gets hardness that comes back from his condensate system, and his conductivity shoots up to four, three, four hundred, which he normally doesn't see because, you know, again, monitoring to see what's going on, so then he can process it and he can process troubleshoot it or, um, you know, start looking into the reasons of what's going on. So, any other questions? 
You ready, bag? They're all ready to rock and roll. They got five hour in them. <laughs> so I'll end Cheyenne. He'll give you a little 411 on him. Best thing about it, he's our Chicago rep. Yeah, don't come up here very often. No, welcome to Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I don't want much sports, so it's okay. I, 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 so it's okay. Uh, so I work down in Chicago. Um, I'm the local rep. Uh, I also have a background in water safety, so I used to work with a lot of hospitals prior to coming for water tech. I've been with water tech for about three years now. So my, I've been on ASHRAE committees. I'm actually on the new standard committee that they're coming out with, SPC 514. So you might see it in another two years or three years, whenever we feel like we want to get done. So you know how those things go. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, let's start with the troubleshooting and corrective actions for cooling. Um, any of you guys run cooling towers here? You? OK. All right, so maybe I'll pick on you a little bit more. <laughs> or less. Maybe I, I want the audience to learn, right? OK. So um, this is, there's some common practices w that we employ when we are working with cooling towers. There's a lot of people that are collecting numbers like your conductivity, your hardness, your calcium hardness, and a couple of other things. But what does that all mean, right? So some genius out there came up with an index, which basically said, OK, if you are within this range, your water's balanced. Okay? And these calculators are available online. You can Google RSI calculator or LSI calculator, and you can find one online. You basically put in all your parameters, and it'll give you ba balance, corrosive, or scaling. And that way you know if your system's working fine or not, right? So even if you don't remember anything I say today, you can say, okay, I have the numbers. What do I do? Go online, plug in my numbers, and find out if my water's balanced or not. Then you definitely know there's a problem or you need to make some adjustments. Um, these parameters are also widely accepted by CTI and ASHRAE. So they are industry standard. Most of the people look at them, and that's what they use. And used for fouling versus biocide rates. So if you, the, a lot of times, if you look, go out and look at your cooling tower and you say, okay, my tower's turning green, what is going on? So that's a visual problem. I need to change my biocide rates, right? And again, same organizations, they kind of have standards saying you need to feed X amount of time um, during the day or whatever. And it also is dependent on how, what kind of a water treatment program you're running. So you, how big of a tower are you guys running at your facility? Um, let's see. Good question. <laughs> I, I, I totally forgot. It, it's OK, no big deal. Are you guys testing for any sort of bacteria or? Yeah, we have chem feed. Oh, okay. But this, this tower I'm doing, it, I'm actually replacing it and I'm designing a new one. Okay. So that's why I'm here is I wanted to get a better background on how to design it properly and size the chemical exclusion. Okay, properly. absolutely. So one of the biggest validation that I always tell people is your bacterial testing, right? So if you are testing for bacteria, that's the only way to know if you're actually clean or not. So doing that on the regular, like at WaterTech, we, we have a standard of doing it once a month, right? Whether it be running your dip slides or doing your Legionella testing, whatever it might be, that's your 100% validation that you're running your system accurately. And we'll get to it in a little bit as well. So um, when you do have, at least for us, uh, what we do is we'll give you a tower control chart which basically has all your ranges of hardness, free chlorine, cooling tower conductivity, and PTR, PTSA trace R. And basically what you, you want to do is run your tower within this parameter. If you are running the, your tower in, in these parameters, you're going to be in the balanced state, which is the RSI or the LSI, depending on which one you use, you are going to be in the balanced state, right? And based on these parameters, we will also have some corrective actions. So if you have high hardness coming in, does anyone want to guess what, what the issue might be? Okay. Yep, there you go. Ding, ding, ding. OK. Um, if you have li less or uh, if you have a uh, little free chlorine and the levels are out of range, see if the pump is primed. See if there's any other issues. And we're going to get into, we're going to dig deeper into a lot of these issues. But this is kind of like more of a generic issues of these are the things that could possibly go wrong or be wrong if you are out of range. Lower or higher, we can also determine. So when 
typically for most of our customers, we'll give you a online portal kind of like this. So you kind of take the guesswork out of um, doing any of the testing. So you fill out all these parameters and it will tell you whether you are in range or not. Okay, so if it turns green, you're good. If it's yellow, you're eh. okay. And if it's red, that means there's something wrong. You got to fi fix something, right? So it's as, as you populate these uh, columns, it'll give you an estimation. And I don't know if it has the RSI. Uh, it does not. But typically, when uh, it might be at the bottom. But typically, when you put in uh, on our system, what happens is once you populate all these numbers, it'll automatically give you an RSI or an LSI reading, which will tell you, okay, balance, not balance, whatever the case might be. Because it does happen sometimes, you could be out of range and still be balanced, and that's not abnormal. It could happen. So, so corrective action. Most common problems that occur um, are conductivity out of range, which means you're either not blowing down your tower, likely, inhibitors out of range, which means you're not feeding enough inhibitor or it's, you know, uh, there's no chemical in the tanks or a bunch of other reasons. Uh, microbiological activity, so um, you're underfeeding or maybe there's other problems that you might need to look into the system. Sediment and algae growth, notice in the tower, which is again, what is a cooling tower, right? It's a giant air scrubber. So it is completely normal to see dirt and debris in the tower but it is just how you manage it, right? Um, I know Jeff Bodendorfer talked about size stream filtration and which ones you could be using, which ones are better. So I'm not gonna get into that, but those are some of the things that you could possibly look at. And automation issues, which is again, very common. Um, when you have a bunch of sensors, sensors could get faulty, sensors could give you bad data. So it's just how you diagnose those problems. <clears throat> so on your regular service, Day, you're taking numbers and you see that your bacterial dip slide is higher. Now what you do is you start looking and saying, okay, I went through this water tech training and I found I know that I need to start looking at it systematically and do a root cause analysis, right? So you check the conductivity level. Conductivity level is fine. Check sediment, build it up in the tower. So you actually have to go up to the roof and look in, in the basin and see if there's a lot of dirt in the tower. Um, and you check your biocide pumps are prime, which means if you're actually pumping chemical into your system, check for chemical tanks, see if there's actually chemical in the tank and that is being transferred into the system. If there's no chemistry, you're not feeding anything. Turn up the feed rate, test for proper biocide residual, and retest bacterial levels in one week. So it's very important, and we'll get to it with the chlorine degradation in time, but what happens is some chemicals lose their strength over time. So you might have to feed 2x as much in order to get the same effect. So just some of the things to keep in mind when working with different systems. So result, we did go up, we checked the tower and the tower had a lot of dirt like this at the bottom which could not be cleaned with chemicals. So you have to drain down the system, power wash it or however you guys wanna do it, clean it out and chlorine was also being underfed, right? So you clean out the tower and you start feeding in your chlorine at the prescribed level. You test for biocide residual after the event to make sure that it is in fact what it should be at the prescribed level by CTI or ASHRAE. And then you retest bacterial levels after one week because that is the ultimate validation of a successful water treatment program. So here's another problem that happened to one of our customers. So this is, um, the PTSA reading should be, depending on this chemistry, I think we, the set point should be around 150 parts per billion, but it was reading at 80. After numerous um, uh, calibrations, it would stay at 80, right? So it was a bad sensor, we changed it out, and we went back up to 140. That's where the system should be feeding. And now what happens is three hours later, we get a flat line. So can you guess what the problem could be? Any thoughts? If you don't have anything to give. No? Okay. No, so we calibrated, right? So as soon as we got the system, because that's the first thing you do, as soon as you put in a new uh, sensor, you calibrate it and make sure that it's reading correctly because you always check handhelds, right? So this is what happened. So we had the operator go down there and make sure the pump was feeding and everything was correct. 
right? So we checked the wiring, the wiring was fine, the chemi there was chemical in the system, we checked it with our handheld and there was actually readings in the system. There was actually water flowing through the system because that's another issue that could happen, right? And faulty sensor out of the box. So it was a bad sensor and we were able to validate that based on multiple sensor readings. Okay, this is what it looks like new. This was, I think, the one we took out, and that's how it looked. So you see a difference? <laughs> so we changed the sensor, you know, nothing that had to be fixed right away, but what we ended up doing was we started feeding. We can feed, let's say, for something like this. What you can do is say, okay, I can manually feed my system for an hour and see if my reading is still flatlined. Right, you can check the relay, if the relay turned on, and, and we don't have level sensor on this graph, but you can actually see if the level of the chemical is going down. If the level of the chemical is go going down, you can say, okay, chemistry is going out of the tank. Now, I don't know if it's going in the system or just falling out, but it's happening. So at that point, you bring in the operator and you say, okay, can you check what's going on? Make sure you look at the wiring, chemicals in the system, flow is going through, the chemicals actually making into the system, it's a faulty sensor, so you get that replaced again. <laughs> okay, see this is some similar problem. You have your dose level going at 150 and, and they start to drop off, right? So again, could be a similar problem. And it's very important because once you, you start to see, let's say your set point is set at, okay, if the level falls below 140 or let's say 130, send me an alarm and you can get an alarm on your phone or your email to kind of see what's going on. It was a bad diaphragm and it was leaking out of the weep. So typically how these systems are designed is there's a weep right here and if there is a chemical leak, it starts dripping over here. So there's typically on our tanks, there's an area where if, again, not a lot of leak, but if it's a small leak, it can be contained right in that spot. So it's in my career, it hasn't happened yet, but provided I've only been in industrial water treatment for seven, eight years, but um, to other people it has had, happened. So you gotta change the pump and put a new pump that can actually get the chemistries in. So this is a healthy graph of ORP versus 5213, which is your chlorine. Uh, does anyone know what ORP is or it stands for? No? Guesses? Come on, guys. Uh, oxygen reduction potential. So in this graph, you have two readings. So you have gallons, which is your sensor. It tells you how many gallons are in the tank. And this is your, uh, the red one is your ORP. So you'll see as the chemistry goes down, when there's a feeding event, when you feed chemistry, your level in the tank is going to go down, but your ORP is going to rise. That means chemical came into the system and the ORP is going to pick it up. And that's going to happen every time there's a feeding event, right? So you're going to see a spike in ORP every time this graph goes down. So you know that they're working in conjunction, everything's fine, nothing to worry about. So we were running low on our chemicals. So you see this is the 20 gallon mark, or we were actually below that. We came in, we feed the system, and we had a feeding event. The ORP spiked a little bit after. We had another feeding event, just a little dip right here, and then the ORP flatlined, right? You call the operator or whoever and you say, okay, um, go down to the system, take a look at the pump, see if there's chemicals in the tank, see what's going on. It was another bad diaphragm. So we replaced the diaphragm, got the pump run running again, and we'll get the ORP back up. So, and flip scenario, right? You have your ORP spikes in the blue and your red is your uh, 5213, which is chlorine that we're feeding. You have your spikes coming in every time you feed and something ro goes wrong right here. What do you think happened? We are gonna go through some of these exercises after this, but just, just out of curiosity, I like to keep people engaged, right? No, this is this is nothing to do with. I don't want to say that. See, that that would be too easy. Three times. So, 
typically what happens is um, over time, chlorine loses its strength, right? So even if your, your feed is constant, right? Let's say you're feeding once a day, twice a day, whatever your feed might be set at, right? Feeding the same, when you got a new delivery, that's when you, that's when you saw this happen. You got this new delivery right here, and this chemical was 100% strength. It hadn't lost any of its strength, right? And you were seeing over here that your chemical was almost done. You are going to see a higher ORP spike with a new, I shouldn't say new, um, when you start off with the fresh dose of chemical, a new shipment that came in and you just open it up and plug it into the system, you're going to see a higher ORP spike in your system because of that reason, because it's still full strength. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. There's a graph that talks about how it degrades over time. So over here, the situation was that there was a pump, this pump. Uh, the diaphragm had to be changed. We changed it. And while doing that, um, a piece of metal screw fell into the tank, right? Now, you're not going to put your hand in a drum full of chlorine, right? Everyone knows that, right? Not normally. Okay. Okay. No, okay. Don't fish it out. I didn't say that, though. Um, so you're not going to fish it out. The gentleman or whoever it was just left the chlorine and the screw in there. And what happens is it starts oxidizing. It starts reacting with the chlorine, right? So we actually went through three drums of chlorine because every time it would lose strength and lose strength very quickly. Because of the metal screw. So we emptied out the tank. We rinsed it out. And... Still, we had the same problem. The problem only went away once we replaced the tank all together. So just that little piece of screw. So I think this is after they rinsed it. And you can see this black layer right here, which is the iron. Oh, screw. Yeah, it was a screw. So those little pieces can be important. So we changed the tank and everything was back to normal after going through three, three tanks of chlorine. So now you know. Don't throw your screws in the tank. <laughs> and don't fish them out either. So this is what happens. This is on, this is on a textbook level, what happen, how your chlorine degrades over time. So when you have fresh delivery, that's why you were seeing a higher spike when you were feeding chlorine. And as you go over time, you're going to see less and less strength. And how we overcome that is if you have all the sensors that you know, typically should be in a cooling tower system, you can set an ORP limit to say, OK, you're going to only spike to, let's say, 400 or 450 or whatever the case might be. And it could vary because ORP readings system to system might be cons in inconsistent. So, and this is for storage life with, with regards to temperature. So the lower the temperature, the longer the shelf life. The hotter the temperature, the shorter it is. So again, this is a no-brainer, lower no chemical in the tank. Obviously, you've got to call WaterTech to come in and replace your chemicals um, and fill it back up so you can start feeding again. So it's important that there's many, many different controllers out there. Uh, the, these are the ones that are in generally the ones that we use mostly and the one that is on the shelf. So you always want to make sure when you take a look at the controller once a day, once a week, whenever it might be, if you don't have remote monitoring set up, that there's no alarms. So you might see a low alarm show up, and that, that should prompt you to go into the system and take a look, what is causing my alarm? Is it a high conductivity? You see over here, this is, it's showing zero. So it's possible that this might be because there's zero conductivity showing, right? But it could be a whole bunch of reasons. But if it shows alarm, you definitely want to go in, check it. If, if, it's a, if it's an error, clear it and see if it comes back. If it comes back, then you need to investigate and see if, if that's an issue. Cleaning sensors. So typically, when we or I go for our monthly service, we'll go in and we'll t take these sensors out and see what, look, what they look like, right? So this graphite tip conductivity sensor is pretty robust. You can clean it with a rag. You can clean it with a, I don't know, a rubber brush, whatever you feel like, right? So this is pretty robust. It won't go bad. 
This, on the other hand, this is an ORP sensor. This is a little bit more delicate. You might want to clean it up with a cleaner, or if you don't have a solution, just a mild grade acid. You can clean it up. And one note of caution here, if you do put the system back up into the system, your readings might be off for a little bit, right? Because it takes time for this sensor to get cleaned up and back to where it was reading. So just be careful when you do clean the system up, make sure you rinse it with enough water to make sure that there's no residual cleaner left on it. And if there is, just know that you might see some readings that are a little bit off than normal. Flow meter. So typically when we have panels like this, um, wh recently what we've done is we've changed this, um, I don't know, old school flow meter to a more electronic one, right? So we can tell from our system electronically if there, there's a drop in the reading. And this happened to me more recently where I started to see my level. So it was kind of similar to this where I'm re running right around seven gallons per minute. And in a matter of two, three weeks, I saw it down to like two gallons a minute, right? What could be the likely culprit? A plug strainer. This one doesn't have a strainer, but mine did. So it was choking the flow through the panel. So what do you do when you see something like this? Just leave it in and walk away, hoping someone would fix it? No? And, uh, there are some people, yes. OK. <laughs> so you clean this back up, you put it back in the system, and you see if your flow comes back up. And that's it. It's just, simple, just simple logical problems, root cause analysis, that can just really make your life easier and make sure you have a well, properly maintained system. And I think that's it for my section. Thank you, sir. Any questions? The good news is on those controllers like that, where I work at, we actually have a visual, uh, I guess, a strainer. Okay. To see, like, filling up and getting the actually dirty, because then you kind of like, all right, I think I'm due for cleaning now. I don't think I'm due for cleaning tomorrow. However, it may be. Yeah, it's, it, it, it ha on mine, uh, I have a different style too. You can actually see the debris caking it up. So every time I go, I'll just be like, you know, I just need to get a habit to shut off the, uh, you know, the line. I drain it out, clean out the strainers, and it's good. You know, it just tells me that I might, the area that I'm in, it's in downtown Chicago, it's 50 stories up, and we get a lot of debris. So a side stream filter on the tower might be very helpful to control your biological, keep the system clean, and a whole bunch of other benefits. So it's just looking at these problems and saying, okay, how can I make my system better? So anyways, good point. Thank you, guys. All right, guys, the next section we're going to go through is troubleshooting and corrective actions, and we have some handouts. Um, for those of you who might be watching remotely, um, you obviously won't get the handout, but there are going to be slides that have the same um, picture on it. So what I'll do is I'll hand these all out, and then we'll go through the examples together. So you'll need, oh, I we should have done this ahead of time if we were smart. And we're going to be starting with the cooling ones first. So they should be labeled uh, boiler and cooling exercises. OK, you're welcome. You know what, why don't we do this? If you just start taking it and pass it around, take one from each folder, that'll be great. All right, bear with us, everyone who's remote. We're just passing out the papers. And are we doing good as far as everyone's good? Doesn't need a break. You want to keep pushing on and, you know, look to get done maybe earlier instead of later? Okay, perfect. Pressure's on. You don't want to be the you don't want to be the the kink in the hose here. You know. Okay, so the first one we'll be going through when you get them, guys, is um, tower exercise problems. So it should look like the sheet like this, where it says tower number two and number three, 
uh, and you'll see that the molybdenum is what's circled on that sheet. Okay, and so what I want you guys to do is uh, take some time to yourself or you can talk to your neighbor if you want and again, maybe why do you think the molybdenum in, in tower number three in this case is reading low, right? versus everything else. And so here's some of the things that you've already done, right? You've checked all these things. Um, and so what do you think is maybe going on? And I'll give you about uh, 30 seconds to think about that and then you know, see if someone has a solution. What do you think would be the corrective action to fix this problem is what we're looking for. So you see your conductivities are for the most part pretty good, right? Tower two, it's in range. Tower three, it's a little high. Your hardnesses are, are good in the system. Your chlorine looks fine. Your bacteria counts are fine. So does anyone have an idea what do they think would be the corrective action for fixing this low molybdenum reading in tower number three? And maybe we'll start with this, because I don't know if it was covered today. All right, when we're running a system, we normally use connectivity as kind of our, our key set point. So if our connectivity is in range in a system that we're controlling via some type of controller, Right? In theory, everything else should be dialed in because as we increase that conductivity, reading should go up with conductivity. As we decrease our conductivity, reading should go down, right? Though, so your molybdenum, your hardness, your chlorine, everything should kind of cycle up and cycle down along with that conductivity. So if you're looking at this and you see, well, my conductivity is actually a little bit on the high side, so shouldn't my molybdenum in theory be maybe a little bit on the high side, right? Maybe one point two, three, 1.5 instead of 0.4. So in this case, you know, again, what do you think would be uh, the potential solution? Do you think it's a matter of your connectivity is too low in that system? And so, well, everything is gonna be low. No, because it's actually a little bit on the high side, right? Not that that's super alarming, but it, it shouldn't be low, right? So what do you think, it, fairly simple, don't overcomplicate it, what would you probably look at doing? Okay, and so ding, 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 your winner, turn up the feed rate on your pump, right? So if your connectivity would have been low, let's say your connectivity was 500, then I would say, well, I expect that to be low because connectivity was low, right? Just like I would expect the total hardness to be low. Um, and so, yeah, something that simple, right? Okay, next uh, tower exercise problem. So it looks like this is what a status report would look like and an alarm report would look like from an e-controller uh, out in the field. So you can see, again, here we're looking at our connectivity reading is high. We know it's high because our set point here says it's 950, um, but yet it's reading 1485. And so what do you think would be maybe a corrective action here? Now this one's gonna take a little bit more, maybe intuitive digging, right? So look, I'll give you a hint. Look all around on it. So look down at the bottom, you can see how much makeup the tower's gone through, how much bleed, is the tower even on? Uh, I'll tell you when it says close, that means the tower's on. Um, so kind of look at everything. So what do we think would maybe cause high conductivity in a system? How do we control conductivity in a system? There's only one way. By bleeding it, right? Okay, so if your conductivity goes high, whether it's a boiler or a cooling tower, this is a cooling tower, but whether it's one or the other, right, it would tell you that you're not bleeding enough, right? Because that's the only way we control our connectivity. We put high connectivity water down the drain, we add in lower uh, concentrated or lower connectivity water to dilute that down, right? You can also see in the middle of your section here, you can see all your outputs. So relay four says bleed valve. It says it's been on for 39 minutes now, 40 minutes straight, right? So, what do you think maybe is the culprit? The valve fail. Actuator fail, valve fail, that's all very good, right? And so I would maybe say, I would, if it was me reaching out to a customer, I would say that's something that I would look to check. And so the solution actually was their Blemo valve would only open up uh, part way. So the actuator had gone bad and it wasn't opening wide enough and bleeding the system quick enough to keep up with the demand that day. Right? So some of those things that you look at, uh, like it said here, run a graph on bleed versus makeup meter. You don't even have to run a graph. If we're normally running three to five cycles in a cooling tower, that's typically where you're at. You're gonna be three to five, somewhere in there, maybe six cycles. Um, and you see 32,000 gallons of makeup and only 500 gallons of bleed, 
that's, those are really high cycles, right? Um, and so right away, that's a great indicator of something's not right. We're not getting enough water down the drain. So good job. You guys did really good on those. Okay, next one, we have boiler. Um, so it's gonna look like uh, this one as boiler one, two, deaerator and condensate. And you'll see that the, uh, we, we see a lot of red on this one. All right, so first off, you might be thinking, holy smokes, what's going on with this system? I can speak more intelligently into why we see such a big discrepancy between the two boilers. But we're gonna focus specifically on the deaerator and the condensate, right? So you have your deaerator pH and your condensate pH are both low. It's supposed to be mid eights uh, to, to mid nines in the deaerator and then you know 8.3 to 8.8 .8 in your condensate. All right, so what do you think? These are the things, you have low pH. So these are some of the things that you can look at checking, right? Your makeup water quality, did that significantly change? Are you running an RO program and the RO, something went haywire with it and now you're no longer getting RO water? Um, did the condensate return water quality change? So now instead of getting really pure condensate back, are you getting some type of city water contamination um, in that system, some type of process contamination? And then uh, you know, look at checking your chemical feed levels. So does anyone have an idea here and maybe what our corrective action would be as far as altering that pH um, in the system? In a boiler system, you're gonna feed an internal treatment, like a polymer for scale control. You're gonna feed an oxygen scavenger for oxygen control to prevent corrosion. And you're gonna feed a steam line treatment that goes out with the steam and then gets returned via what back to the boiler? What system? Condensate, right. So out of those three chemistries, which one do you think is uh, affecting or impacting your condensate? Steam line treatment, which would then in turn affect your deaerator because you're returning that condensate back into it, right? So while we don't feed it directly for deaerator or feed water control, it plays an impact on it because if the condensate's not good coming back, it's going to impact your uh, deaerator or your feed water going into your boiler. So what do you think would be an adjustment here? Again, connectivities look good how they normally are. You know, your alkalinities look good for the most part. Um, hardness is fine. Iron's not high. The deaerator looks like, you know, for the most part, the temp and the pressure are, are correlating kind of where they should be, a little, little skewed. What do you think would be something that we would maybe look at doing here to correct that? Again, go to the most simple condensate answer. Water. Say that again? Condensate return water quality. Yep. So what would we do to impact that? How would we how would we edit or adjust that pH? What are we feeding again? Right? So we're feeding a chemistry. Yep. Sure maybe it's 3516 that we're feeding, right? Or 3508 or 3520 or if you're using one of our chemistries, right? So you probably look at turning up that pump, right? And so uh, again, the pump loss prime. Now we're going to have a video here that, oh, I take that back. That's coming up in a couple slides. I don't know why I did that. So we always want to adjust our, our uh, condensate uh, pump before our, it would be our 37, 31, excuse me, right? Sure. So the question was, should we adjust our condensate pump or our steam line treatment pump versus our caustic pump? So if you're running an RO program, you're feeding caustic as well into your feed water to boost that pH and alkalinity in the system because the RO has stripped all that out. The answer to that would be only if your pH in your condensate is effective. If, you're, if your pH here in the condensate was 8.5, but yet your pH here was still 6.2, then you would be looking at the caustic, right? Because your condensate's good. Um, so again, in this case, the pump had lost prime. Oh, maybe you ran out of chemical. Always check, obviously, if the drum or the tank is empty. Uh, or again, if the pump lost prime, you're just not getting it fed in. Um, and again, we always look to first default to, well, what's my conductivities? If those are in range, everything else should be in range if the system's dialed in, unless we typically lose prime or we run out of chemistry, something like that, right? And so when you see that those are good, it's not like they went sky high uh, in your condensate to know that maybe process contamination is the cause, then you kind of know where to look, right? Okay, it's probably my pump. Okay, so now here's where we have a uh, uh, short video again, just looking at, okay, you, I'll ask you guys to tell me which pump is primed versus not primed after we watch the videos, okay? 
So it's the video on the left. Are not set points are not wrong. So if connectivity is in range, it should be in range, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not in range. So do we think that's because we're overfeeding, underfeeding, feeding the right amount? I think we might have a look at the duration of the pump. Okay. Driving. Okay. So uh, so yes, I would say uh, in this one, right, again, you know you're you're high here. Uh, in boiler six, your connectivity is really low, 
yet your polymer is in range, mm -hmm. right? And so we're feeding the right amount of polymer here based upon this reading, but if this 687 here was actually 2,500, it would also be high, right? Mm -hmm. So it means we're overfeeding chemistry in this instance. Now, this is a tricky account in that they have six boilers. They don't need all six boilers at all times. We always have boilers that are out of range, so we have to overfeed chemistries to try to protect the boiler that's not running. So it's a challenge in and of itself in that way. Um, but we are overfeeding our polymer in this case. And you can confirm that with boiler four, or also if you look at boiler six, and, well, gosh, if my conductivity is that low, right, it's, it's less than half of what it should be. I should be less, of, less than half of what I should be on my polymer, right? Same thing with uh, our sulfite. So you can see here, look how big our range is. We normally never run 30 to 100, maybe 30 to 60. But here we have to feed 90 to 100 ppm of sulfite into the lead boiler to make sure we get, try to get on the low end in that lag boiler, that standby boiler, especially in summertime when they really don't have that much of a heat demand. All right, so that's kind of what we talked about. And then again, this you want to know, but water loss, is that why? So that would be one of the things that I would check, right? Why is that boiler so low? Are we losing water uncontrolled? Now, we're not, right? I'm telling you that because they have boilers that rotate, that boiler is not running at all. And so it's just, it's, it's going to always be low. And then the next week when that one now becomes a lead and this one becomes a lag, you're going to see them flip-flop. So. Okay, not related. So the key point here is the conductivity uh, in boiler six being low is not related at all to the total polymer being high in boiler four, right? So each boiler is its own separate thing. And this one's saying, okay, the low conductivity is due to water loss. It very well could be. In this case, it's this boiler is just not running. So, okay. And now with that, we'll move over to boiler startup. So 